You're with Alan Juddy, and this is another episode of Seed Dating, the podcast where you get to meet one of Agricom's forage products, learn about its attributes, and match it to your farm system. And here to help nurture this new blossoming relationship is our very own forage relationship expert, Alistair Moorhead. Hi, Al, and who are we going to meet today? Hi, Juddy. I'm really excited about this one. I can see it. Yeah, really, really, really excited. Who are we meeting? Let's meet a line. Tetraploid perennial ryegrass. It's one smart grass. What do you mean it's a smart grass? Like, is it brainy or something? Well, in some ways it is, Juddy. So tell me more. What we're talking about here is a tetraploid perennial ryegrass, and uh, it's an extremely high, high, highly productive style. But over the time that I've watched tetraploid perennials function in the marketplace, one of the traits a lot of people focus on is the overgrazing or the mismanagement of tetraploid ryegrasses in the summertime. Now, on average, I don't actually agree with that. Uh, I actually believe the biggest detriment uh, to tetraploid perennial ryegrasses, other than insect pressure and endophyte uh, suitability, uh, is actually winter wear and winter grazing management, particularly over time, particularly when the pastures are not no longer managed as new. Yep. They're aged and they have to go through every farmer's winter grazing practices. And what I see there is that uh, the any sort of openness during winter grazing, uh, particularly with cattle, is quite damaging to pasture. So I see winter grazing as one of the weaknesses of an open, upright, tetraploid model. So that's not that's not um, uh, wintering on it. It's not strip grazing during winter, but I suspect what you're no, talking no, about- No, actually it is. Quite regularly, it is strip grazing. Like, for example, most dairy systems in New Zealand, once you get out past one or two years of age, your pasture must be split into multiple grazing breaks under wet conditions with a heavy dairy cattle. So I guess what I was saying is is, um, uh, this is not um, right in the middle of winter. It can be, but but don't – uh, uh, don't fall into the trap of just assuming that it's um, I'm not all grass wintering, for example. No, no. It's that um, wet period going into winter where you might be slowing down your autumn rotations, and as you come out in the spring where um, you know your you, feed you, supply you, is not meeting demand, you must shut down your paddocks. Yeah, and, and in doing that, you have to graze during wet conditions. Yes, and 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 that that winter wear, as you say, um, then becomes a, a really important part. And and we typically say, well, um, that's really only a job for a diploid ryegrass or a very dense ryegrass. Or, or, or people might consider that if they're in wet country, which many, many dairy landscapes are. Yep. Um, you might consider that using uh, a denser style of grass with more tillers and more ground cover is more suitable. But that 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 is, leads into what makes a line so special because it is a type of grass that is highly productive in, in all seasons of the year. It's very, very competitive. In, in winter, it's very, very competitive in spring. And it, it is a, an extremely dominant summer and autumn producer. Mm. So they are the, the seasonality traits of it. Um, but as I've just described to you, one of the hesitancies I've often had with the tetraploid model is just what farmers do to pastures in winter, particularly in late winter and early spring wet weather grazing. And at this time, uh, a lion has this awesome trait of actually um, sort of, I wouldn't never say hunkering down because it's still yielding, but actually becoming very, very dense. And so compared to a lot of styles that are in the industry at the moment, a lion would sit there as a very dense example as a ryegrass, often almost as dense as a diploid right at that window of time in late winter and early spring. And I really value that because the reality is that is when the most damage can be done in a grazing system. And the denser you are at that moment, the more resilient you are coming out. It will not protect you against a wet weather grazing event. A line will still take some damage. But relatively speaking, it's a really smart way to get there. And it's smart because that is not how a line looks for the rest of the year. It just does that in the end of winter and early spring, almost at the perfect window of time for when you need the tolerance 
to get past that farm management practice. And then all of a sudden it just explodes into this a very productive, very upright, very visual looking plant that is really delivering, you know, quality dry matter deep into late, su- uh, late spring, right into early summer, pasture management all through spring and even right into summer is exceptionally good. So it's, it's, a, it's a perennial ryegrass that requires very, very little pasture management for the rest of the calendar year. Yeah, and so the, the the smartness that you talk about is that ability to to be be dense at a time where it may be subject to more of this um, uh, damage from from pasture grazing wear, pasture yep. wear, and but but <coughs> retain the 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 ability as uh, tetraploids do to to produce uh, high quality and a large amount during that um, the, the the spring and summer periods. And and you could very well ask me, you know, why I'm so excited about having a line in our, our portfolio. And one of the reasons is that, you know, we are a very big diploid perennial ryegrass uh, business model. But what I really value, apart from the fact that it's just an exceptional example of a tetraploid perennial, like a really strong summer style, you know, a time of year where you can really get a lot out of a tetrapoid ryegrass, both in the dairy production system, but also in the animal finishing system. Uh, It's got, you know, great rust tolerance. It's got all these other traits. But what really interests me is particularly in a landscape where we may slowly see a reducing stocking rate, spring and summer pasture management becomes a bigger and bigger issue on farm as stocking rates soften. And if you're a business that is still feeding large cows, focusing on per head performance and less about per hectare performance, you're trying to get value out of a per head outcome, sometimes you find pasture management becomes a greater and greater issue and your management skills to keep seed head out of pasture, to keep dead leaf out of pasture, managing leaf diseases because you've left too long of rotations, you jump paddocks, all of those decisions become harder and harder as your stocking rate softens. And I did not want to be without a high performance tetraploid ryegrass in an environment that uh, grazing management may become harder and harder because of a reducing stocking rate. Yeah, and again, probably uh, adds to its smartness, if you like, in terms of um, needing less control over that grazing period from topping and- Absolutely. uh, And a line would be defined by that. It would be defined by being an incredibly clean grass with very little seed head in it throughout the calendar year. Uh, A grass that uh, can be held uh, high covers and maintain quality for a prolonged period of time. Um, You know, management friendly all the way through the cycle. And- uh, and a very resilient style of grass. So, yeah, some massive traits that I truly value. Um, I do see it uh, as as something that uh, you know an existing tetraploid user would be should be really interested in seeing how it works in their farms. For a person moving from a, a diploid option towards a tetraploid outcome, you know, uh, a line would make a wonderful mixing pasture. Uh, a component of a diploid tetraploid pasture mix, uh, and would be a really good. Uh, um, addition to literally any flowering date from another uh, a diploid category. So it's a, a very impressive plant. So you've touched on this a little bit, but let's just go back over this. Um, uh, obviously, dairy pastures, um, this is a, a something that um, a line would work very well in. Um, we've talked a little bit about um, beef um, finishing pastures. Um, if I was a sheep farmer, how, uh, how would you see um, uh a line working and and what part of this production system would you see that contributing to? I would definitely fit it into a relatively high fertility environment where you had uh, decent rainfall that you actually could get summer growth because its conversion to a finishing pasture is exceptional. So its ability to be set stock through the spring with that density and tolerate a set stocking phase, uh, coming uh, off and weaning your animals uh, and often as uh, right as you start rotations and start weaning, a lot of pastures go to seed on a sheep farm. And so it's all very well not being in seedy state, but when you get out on a rotation, your farm tends to lose con- lose control. And there's no doubt that a line fits that window of time exceptionally as a weaning pasture to drop lambs straight onto after they've come off their mothers. Uh, and then it just carries on. And so mixed with a, thing, uh, a clover content like a tribute white clover or a relish red clover, those, those combined would create an awesome 
you know, post weaning finishing feed for young stock all the way through um, you know, early summer, basically. And as and as a good um, it's a good uh, grass to hold clover content. Is yeah, it? absolutely. Tetraploids are, are normally typically really solid, mainly because of the high level utilization, and you're consistently grazing to target residuals really well. Quite often, you need good management not to overgraze them. Again. If you overgraze the style of grass, I often believe that sometimes you take and rob a little bit of the total yield that you can get from a, a genetic such as a line by overgrazing. You rob f- future regrowth cycles. You don't get the best out of them. So, an element of pasture management with a tetraploid is always desirable because overgrazing often leads to lack of production for the foreseeable future. And it takes a long time to recover from overgrazing events. So I see it takes a little bit to, to manage. I think the density uh, under those conditions of a line, again, would benefit it for those moments. Well, Ding, uh, well, that's, um, that's uh, a great update. Uh, looks like a, both a, a beauty and quite intelligent sort of a grass. So we've been talking about a line, um, the smart tetraploid, um, and the smartness comes from its holding its density at a time that can be challenging um, in those uh, wet, wet periods. Um, it's very high dry matter producer, has a very strong summer and autumn growth, um, and looks like it's just a all-round really smart grass. So um, quite eye-catching and, and uh, looks to be uh, very intelligent. So today I'm identifying as a uh, as a dairy farmer um, and a line looks like it's going to uh, tick all the boxes for me, so I'm swiping right. And you've been listening to another episode of Seed Dating with Alan Juddy and we hope we can catch another episode soon. <laughs>